Yeah, if you want to get into a fight, it's easy to get into a fight. It's much harder to walk away, to disengage, to de-escalate, because you have to put ego aside. Hey there, how's it going? This is episode 114 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Gershon Ben Karen. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts podcast. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm also blessed enough to be your host for Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show or our great products, please take a look at our shin guards. They're double thick, ergonomically designed, and take a beating, like all of our sparring gear. As with the rest of our sparring gear, our shin guards are available at whistlekick.com and on Amazon. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to everything we talk about today with Mr. Ben Karen, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, sign up now. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter list at any of our websites. Frequent listeners know that we try to bring on people from different martial arts. It's important to be a well-rounded martial artist, and part of that involves learning about the different perspectives that different martial artists have, especially those that train in less common arts. While we've had a few guests on the show that trained in Krav Maga, none of them have defined themselves as Krav Maga practitioners. And until recently, I wasn't even aware of how old Krav Maga was. So when Mr. Gershon Ben Karen came to my attention as a Krav Maga practitioner who started training long before the current wave, he seemed like the perfect candidate to have on the show. While Mr. Ben Karen isn't here to represent Krav Maga, being the first person steeped in that art on this show carries a bit of responsibility with it. I was very honest with him of this, but also let him know that the episode was about him and not his chosen art. I think we both did a good job of placing him first, but also giving you some information on the history of the style, which was important in giving you context for our guests. I really enjoyed getting to know Mr. Ben Karen, and with his school only a few hours away, it's just a matter of time before I pop by for a visit. Let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Ben Karen, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And of course, you are going to be our first full Krav Maga guest. We've had some other guests who have done Krav Maga, have supplemented their training or have shifted over to Krav Maga from other styles. But you're a Krav Maga guy. Yep so to speak, right? Yes. And so th- I'm excited to have you on the show for that reason, because you're going to give us a different perspective on some of these things. Now, uh, just to kind of throw it out there to the audience, because there is a little bit of a, um, I don't want to say stigma, a belief that Krav Maga is a very new system. And I'm not going to ask you to speak to the age of it. Specifically, the show is about you, not about Krav Maga, but we'll have some links in the show notes for anyone that is interested okay. in learning about the age of Krav Maga and why it is absolutely appropriate that we would include Krav Maga as a style, um, not that we exclude styles really, but uh, why we would include that as a traditional martial art. Yes. So uh, why don't you start the way we ask all of our guests to start and tell us a bit about your history. How did you get started? Well, my background was actually in judo. Um, as a kid, uh, around the age of six, uh, I changed schools and was subjected to bullying. So my parents took me along to different martial arts schools. And I went to karate. Uh, I went to judo. I never really understood karate, uh, though since uh, I've continued to practice it. But judo was what really kind of grabbed me. So I practiced a lot of judo uh, uh, to quite a high competitive level. What got me into Krav Maga was I had a back injury that took me out of competitive judo. I took some time rehabilitating in Israel. I'm Jewish, so I thought it would be a good time to kind of like check out my roots. And on a kibbutz, I saw two guys practicing what I now know as Krav Maga. And when they first demonstrated it to me, it made absolutely no sense to me. Coming from a traditional martial arts background where there was such an emphasis on building skills first, and developing uh, physical attributes that made the techniques work, Krav Maga kind of came at it from a different angle and didn't stress the need for all that development of skills first. So there was a kind of immediacy 
to it. Uh, coupled with this at the time, I was at university and I'd started doing door work, which is a little bit different in the UK to the US. In the US, uh, it tends to be a lot of ID checking. In the UK, it tends to actually be dealing with physical altercations. So up until that point, I've been dealing with everything from a kind of judo perspective, from a grappling, throwing uh, angle. So actually having this more striking uh, type art started to complement my judo when I came back and continued to work door. At the time, there was very little actual Krav Maga in the UK. So what I had to do was fly back to Israel uh, a couple of times a year to actually keep updated and continue my training. Um, that then started to change when I moved to a city called Liverpool, and I started training with some uh, guys who I met in the Rotunda Boxing Club, because again, I was coming from that grappling background and doing security work, didn't really have any striking art. So to sort of supplement that, uh, I started to box, and these two guys who were part of the Jewish Defense League in Liverpool uh, came over, I have a tattoo which kind of identifies myself as being Jewish, asked me if I was Jewish, told them yes, and I started training with them. Uh, so that was sort of started my more formal Krav Maga training. So I was actually starting to get regular Krav Maga training in the UK. Then later on, I moved down to London and Krav Maga started to really come on the scene. So there were actually schools I could go and train at. So kept training. Uh, Eventually was asked by one of the associations, they were saying it was about time that I did the instructor course. So I had a 29 day uh, intensive instructor course and then started teaching Krav Maga and that was about uh, 15 years ago. Okay. So there aren't a lot of people that we've had on the show that have been involved and deeply involved in a martial arts style at the forefront. I mean, it sounds like as you were getting going, I mean, you, you had to travel to Israel to yep. train. I mean, that's kind of would be the equivalent now of someone involved in Taekwondo having to fly to Korea to train or, or it, it, practice their karate in Japan. Absolutely. Um, and I was lucky from that perspective because since um, I would say the last 10 years ago, it's become a lot more commercial. And the people who go to Israel now for kind of like intensive seminars and uh, instructor courses are getting a more commercialized view of what Krav Maga is. Uh, it's also true that at the time I started training, because Krav Maga is still evolving and developing, there were certain aspects of the system that hadn't really been developed. So when I started training, there wasn't um, a particularly large groundwork component in Krav Maga. In fact, there was a very much like, just stay on your feet. And it's interesting that when uh, the UFC started up and the Gracies came on the scene and demonstrated how a stand-up fighter could be taken to ground, that there was suddenly a lot more interest in Israel about groundwork. So I've kind of seen in that side of the system, the development and the importance of groundwork. And that's one of the kind of advantages of coming in early on. You get to see the thinking behind the evolution of the system. Because what a lot of people don't realize about Krav Maga is they tend to think of it as a one distinct style, where actually it's an umbrella term that the IDF uses to cover a lot of different fighting systems uh, that it uses. And what kind of links the Krav Maga systems together are a set of common concepts and principles. Uh, and this is one of the ways you can always tell if an instructor has legitimacy because they should be teaching according to these concepts and principles. So what was interesting to me was to actually see things like groundwork and ground fighting develop according to the principles of Krav Maga, which gives you a sort of understanding as to the thinking behind the system. So I was very fortunate and privileged from that perspective. Okay. Now, you mentioned a couple times that from the, from the time that you started with Krav Maga to now you've seen some commercialization. What do you mean when you say that? Um, so if we look at Krav Maga as Krav Maga, it's a fighting system. One of the things that's kind of got known as now is a great fitness workout. Uh, mm. In Israel, we refer to the fitness side as a kosher kravi, which means combat fitness. And we train that kind of separately to the actual fighting style. 
But with the interest in America, the UK, Europe, in losing weight, getting fit, a lot of that kosher kalavi has kind of been incorporated into our regular Krav Maga classes. So what people have now as a perception of Krav Maga is like, it's a great workout. So often when people come to Israel uh, to train, many of the instructors will present that view of Krav Maga to them because that's what they're expecting. And so from a commercial perspective, there's been a kind of like a uh, slight sideways shift in the fitness aspect of Krav Maga rather than the fighting side of Krav Maga. Okay, that, that makes sense. And I, I can see that. And it's it's a niche that Krav Maga, at least from my exposure in the United States, has done very well with. Oh, absolutely. It's something that, um, you know, traditional karate and taekwondo schools that offer sort of a cardio kickboxing yep. uh, don't seem to have had that same penetration. There hasn't been that same response. People seem to feel really, um, you know, kind of hardcore I, if they're going to Krav Maga class versus a cardio kickboxing class. And, and I think a lot of people have uh, leveraged the uh, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces side of that. Uh, the Israeli military place a huge, huge emphasis on fitness. So if you're looking for a kind of, I would say, guarantee, as it were, to get fit and lose weight, and you're looking for the best example of that, uh, the Israeli military kind of is a good stand-up example. So you have many instructors and associations which are kind of promoting that aspect uh, of the Israeli training, of the fitness, into their Krav Maga class. And I think it's a case of, you know, people want to feel confident that they're going to lose weight and they want the good example and the Israeli military is one of them. Uh, so this is where you see a lot of kind of schools which stress, you know, this is the system of the IDF, this is the system of the Israeli military, uh, really just to promote that fitness angle. Got it. Okay. So it's great to hear some of that context. It gives us, you know, an idea of sort of that progression. I, I'm going to guess that the majority of the listeners that have been exposed to Krav Maga have been exposed in the last five years, you know, so you've got a significant amount of time that you've seen that progression versus the right. rest of us. So I, th I think that's great to bring that in. And of course, if you're traveling all over the UK and traveling to Israel and you're doing all this Krav Maga and you're training judo, you, you've experienced a lot with a lot of different people. And of course, stories always come out of those exchanges. Yes. We love stories here on this show. So tell us your best story. Um, most of my stories really come more from my time uh, applying Krav Maga in the security industry. Um, that's really my background. Uh, so one of the stories I always try and uh, get over to my students is a lot of people think when you're talking about self-defense, when you're talking about fighting, that everything is all about contact how many punches you threw, how many elbows. Krav Maga kind of takes a different approach to that. Um, we kind of take the approach that you're there to solve a problem. And it really doesn't matter how you solve that problem, whether you solve that problem by picking up an improvised weapon, whether you solve that problem through de-escalation, de or whether you solve it through disengagement. And one of the things that we try and teach people is to choose the first effective solution. So not the best solution. So uh, a good example of that, of sort of Krav Maga in action, was one of the times I was working door. This was when I was much younger and a little bit more naive and a little bit more stupid. And there was a group that we had to kick out of the club that I was working at. And we kicked them out and they dispersed. And I, like the fool I was at the time, started running after one of them. Um, and everybody peeled off and were going their separate ways. So I was chasing this one guy. Suddenly he stopped and he pulled a knife. And I'm thinking, like, I really don't want to deal with this. This is not a, a situation, a confrontation that I want to be involved in. So what I did was we were in a parking lot. I moved behind a parked car. And basically we had a cartoon-style chase where he was running one way around the car. I was running the opposite way. And all I was waiting for was I knew that there would be two other doormen that would be following me and getting to me in time. So one of the things with Krav Maga is everybody sees it as a very confrontational type of style where, oh, I should have run in, I should have tried to disarm the guy, I should have tried to control the knife. But really, 
if I'm looking at the first effective solution, disengaging and putting a barrier between me and that person is a much more effective solution. Um, so when we look at sort of like Krav Maga in practice and application, it doesn't always have to be that it's a physical confrontation with strikes thrown, with kicks and punches, with throws, with takedowns. It can be purely disengagement. And sometimes the best kind of Krav Maga stories are the most boring stories like that, where nothing happens. Because we put a great emphasis on disengagement and de-escalation and avoiding the problem in the first place. So a lot of the training that we do um, has that predictive element where we learn to identify what a violent situation actually looks like, how it develops, and how we can avoid it, uh, how we can possibly disengage from it, and how we can possibly de-escalate it. And we really have that physical part as a very much a kind of last resort when we have no other option. Um, one of the guys that I train with, uh, Dr. Gabriel Snyder, has a kind of saying which says, you fight for two reasons, ego or survival. What we try and do is put ourselves in a position where we're never fighting for ego. We're only fighting for survival. So a good example of that in the story is what led me on that chase was pure ego. There was no need for me to do it. Once a guy pulled the knife, now it's a matter of survival. So if I had to have dealt with him physically, it's basically I'm fighting for survival. So all the cards are on the table. There's nothing that I'm restricting myself from doing. And this is sometimes where Krama Gar gets the uh, view of being a very kind of brutal, uh, no-holds-barred, aggressive style martial art, where really what we do is only ever put ourselves in a position to fight for survival. And when that's the case, the way that we deal with violence is by using extreme violence. That makes sense. I want to go back for, for a second. I, I really like the way you put it, that the best Krav Maga stories are kind of boring. Yeah. Because nothing happens. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's something that within the context of martial arts, we don't talk about as much anymore. I remember, you know, I've been training um, by a lot of people's definitions a long time, certainly not as long as some and some that are listening. But when I was being raised in the martial arts, we talked a lot about strategies to avoid, yeah. to de-escalate, to disengage as you're talking about. And I've noticed over time that those strategies have become less important in a lot of schools. Now, I certainly can't speak to all of them. I can't yeah. speak to it on a style by style basis, but uh, to the point where we actually did an episode, one of our shorter Thursday episode episodes, on avoiding fights right. altogether. And I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. But I think that that's great that you're bringing that up. No, one, you know, because it sounds like it is core within Krav Maga. And I think that's amazing. And two, because we all spend a lot more time not fighting than we do fighting. Absolutely. And, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but one of my instructors way, way back said the only way you win a fight is to not even get into it. I, I would agree with that. You're coming out with some injury. You're coming out with uh, some harm to you. I've never been involved in a physical confrontation altercation where I haven't taken a punch, where I haven't taken some form of injury, whether minor or major. Um, and this is where we really can't, when we look at reality-based self-defense and real-life confrontations, talk about winning. Because unless somebody can produce some sort of grid or matrices that says, you know, if you walk away with a broken nose and the other guy walks away with a broken arm, you're the winner. Uh, right. I've still got a broken <laughs> nose. So it's one of those things where I, I would totally agree with that statement, that you're probably coming away with some consequence. So it's much better to avoid that fight and avoid that consequence. Uh, I always think that the sort of, I, I, I look a lot to the animal world where you look at um, how dogs and wolves resolve disputes. It's rarely through fighting. It's normally through a bit of posture and a bit of submission. And this makes absolute sense because a wolf pack needs every member for its own survival. It needs every member to be able to hunt. So if they spent all the time actually fighting and injuring each other, the survival of that pack could be in question. Um, and when you look at kind of that mentality, it makes absolute sense. 
why in that situation with the story I told, would I try and confront somebody with a knife? Because if I got stabbed, forget like the pain, but just even the economic, you know, consequences of not being able to work. You know, it's the same kind of as sure. that wolf pack yeah. of not being able to survive. So I always get a much more of a, a kick out of the stories that my students tell when it's about how they avoided the situation rather than how they physically dealt with a situation. Uh, I get sort of emails where somebody will say they might have trained with me four or five years ago, and I'll get an email that says, thank you for your teaching. It stopped me doing something very stupid last night. And that to <laughs> me is like the best email. And I would much rather receive that than somebody saying, and then I grabbed him, and then I threw five punches, and then because why are you in that situation? So again, the stories that I always like to hear from my students are kind of like that one about not being involved in the fight with a guy with a knife in the parking lot. They're the much more enjoyable and productive stories to me because that tells me that somebody actually, it's easy to get into a fight. Yeah, if you want to get into a fight, it's easy to get into a fight. It's much harder to walk away, to disengage, to de-escalate because you have to put ego aside for that. And those are the stories that I find much more rewarding to the training that I give than the physical ones. And I'm glad you brought that up, the ego component. It's something that's come up a bit on the show and, and I won't belabor in what ways, <laughs> but it's so true. You know, I, I 100% agree with you and I hope the listeners really hear what you're saying, that you can't you can't really let go of your your ego and and still charge into a fight. Or maybe I'm phrasing that poorly, but I, I think you know where I'm Absolutely. going. It's to 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 say, you know what? I'm enough of a fulfilled. Um, you know, whether, whether you're you're a man or a woman, it does not matter. Yeah. I'm enough of a man. I'm enough of a woman to walk away from this opportunity to fight. Absolutely, and I, I don't I don't need to I don't need to take this bait. I don't need to engage with this person to prove anything. And I think one of the things, uh, so my background is in the traditional martial arts. I still train. I would actually class Kramagawa as a traditional martial art. Um, but when I was growing up as a kid within judo, we were taught about humility, about respect, about honor, about discipline. And for me, these were all things which basically were to create in you that sense of your own self-worth that you can walk away without putting ego on you know, display and being driven by it. What I find funny is as I came into sort of adulthood in the martial arts, that got lost and it became more about that physical confrontation, more about the fight. Um, and it strikes me as kind of funny that the values that we're teaching in the martial arts to children, we're not really stressing in the same way to adults. And yet, in many ways, it's much more important because the consequences of adult violence, where we're talking about multiple attackers, weapons, are probably a lot more serious than those consequences for childhood violence. And that ability to walk away is even more important. And yet, somehow, that's kind of become very downplayed in martial arts. And I will include, you know, certain schools and thoughts of Krav Maga, um, when really you know, it's more important as an adult than a child in many ways when we look at actually surviving a real-life confrontation because walking away is always your best, well, I wouldn't say always, is, I don't know, 95% of the time your best option. Right. And I think you just really hit on something that I, I don't know if I've just kind of missed this observation or if a, a bunch of others out there have too. You're right. In adult classes, these very fundamental combat avoidance lessons, the, these self-esteem lessons are not taught. It's a shame. It's a real shame. I, I feel traditional martial arts, as traditional martial arts, uh, as people think of them, really do still have a role to play. We take in our school a very traditional approach in terms of promoting those values. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they first come to a Kramaga school such as ours, they're expecting a kind of Wapham Sockham type of experience. Um, and although they kind of do get that, 
at the same time, they're getting that stress of like, you know, we're trying to build your self-worth. We're trying to build your character so that you're not getting involved in petty squabbles. Um, and it's funny, uh, there was a conversation I overheard between two students maybe a couple of years ago where one of them was saying that before they came to this train, they would have been the guy that would be, you know, flipping somebody off, you know, calling somebody out and all of these type of things. But after a couple of years of training, they're like, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. Now, that's not a set of physical techniques they've learned. That's a kind of outlook on the world that they've learned. And they've realized that getting involved in petty arguments and disputes isn't worth it and can lead to serious consequences. So I see a big part of what we do in our school is not just training those physical solutions, but basically developing and rounding out the individual so that they feel that they have no need to use them. Um, and in that way, you know, our students can turn around and say, yeah, I use Krav Maga every day. You know, the time that I didn't mm. uh, get angry when somebody cut me off in traffic or didn't feel the need to follow them slamming on my horn. You know, that's Krav Maga training. Um, right. So we try uh, and stress those traditional values. And that's where I really do see Krav Maga as a kind of holistic martial art rather than just as a self-defense system. So clearly martial arts, Krav Maga are very important to you, but I'm sure there's more to who you are and what you do in life than martial arts. Um, maybe, maybe it's most of it, but I'm sure you've got some other things that you've got, right? I mean, we've had plenty of guests on who, you know, I'd say sleep, eat, and train, and that's probably 95% of their life, but there's at least something else going on. What, what are you doing when you're not training and teaching? Um, I... I do a lot of uh, weightlifting. Um, one of the things when I, I know this is connected, a lot of things I do support <laughs> kind of the martial arts lifestyle. Uh, and I'll talk about some other things. I also do a lot of reading. Um, but one of my passions is uh, weightlifting and particularly strongman. When I was working with the uh, national uh, squad, the British judo squad, uh, back in the 90s, there was a big stress on, on um, physical performance. It, it's interesting to me watching how judo's changed. When I was coming into that sort of adult competitor judo, um, we were taking a lot of uh, our guidance from the Germans who had sort of developed this very uh, robust physical judo style. Um, I look now on the way that judo uh, is practiced and taught, and us as competitors wouldn't stand a chance. Now we would just be too slow, too strong, too rigid. Um, but back in the day, I was introduced to like uh, lifting weights, and that really caught as a passion. And one of the things that's recently moved on is I started to do strongman training. And what I like about strongman training is there's actually a parallel with Krav Maga. So I started off doing Olympic lifting where you're doing things like the clean and jerk, and it's very artificial. You're putting your body in a weird position, as it were, to lift a bar over your head. It's totally non-functional. It's great, it's fun, but it's non-functional. When I started to do strongman training, that was lifting how the body wanted to lift. So it was kind of using natural movement. And this is something that uh, Krav Maga uses. What we try and do in Krav Maga is based everything off instinctive or instinctual movement. So I kind of sort of parallel with the strongman lifting. If I'm going to lift a, an atlas stone, I'm going to lift it how the body wants to lift that weight in a very functional way. So mm. I've kind of fallen in love with that type of uh, lifting training. Uh, and we do a lot of it at the gym, we, uh, the studio that I have. We have a big gym area, 4,000 square foot, where it's kind of open, where we tie a flip. Uh, where we work with logs, where we work with uh, the stones, we have Viking press and all of those things. Uh, so one of my big passions is uh, lifting. Um, and if I'm not training uh, martial arts, a lot of the time I'll be lifting. And if I'm not lifting, I'm probably reading. So that's that's kind of my okay. life. Great. And of course, you know, there is a lot of correlation between martial arts and the way that a lot of people approach strongman or crossfit we've yep. heard on the show that, that yep. i do crossfit we've had several other martial artists on that have done crossfit and um for for those of you that 
that maybe don't do CrossFit and have friends that have bent your ear way too much about it. Um, I, I want you to know that we have contained most of those conversations to before <laughs> and after the show. Uh, I have spared you. So Thank you. Uh, be happy there. <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. So when you're reading, what kind of stuff are you reading? Um, I, without trying to say, I, I read a lot of classics. Um, my education in the UK, uh, I had a very formal traditional school education. Um, so I still enjoy a lot of classics. The other thing that I really enjoy is uh, American beat writers. So Jack Kerouac, uh, On the Road, is probably one of my favorite books. Um, and I found that at a time when it was kind of like, in my own life, um, I'd had the injury from the judo. And I kind of felt very stuck. And that was one of the books that actually kind of like changed my outlook on life and freed me up um, from trying to follow a kind of very traditional uh, employment route. It sort of gave me that excuse that you don't have to live your life in this kind of prescribed way. And probably if I hadn't read that book, I would have continued with my academic uh, career. I have a master's in psychology. Uh, and I'd probably gone into uh, a lot more of a research role. And reading that, it was one of those books where it was like, you kind of don't have to do that. You can follow your passion. You can follow your dream. And so that's probably been one of the most influential books in actually letting me take this particular path uh, and career. And I don't think um, if I hadn't read it, I probably wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd have probably been working in a university somewhere. Mm. Okay. It's nice to round out a little bit more about who <laughs> you are outside of being a martial artist. It's, it's nice for us to get to understand what makes you tick. So I'd like you to think now about maybe a difficult time in your life, whether that was, you know, in a, an acute situation, you know, one particular day where maybe being chasing someone around the car, being chased <laughs> by someone around the car didn't go as well, or maybe something a little bit less uh, potentially violent. Um, Tell us about that situation and how your martial arts training helped you overcome it. Oh, um, okay. It's a fairly graphic story, and it goes back to um, when I was in the military, and I was over in Northern Ireland, and I was a British soldier, and this was off duty. I ended up getting cornered by three guys, and they worked out that I was Army, haircut, different accent and they basically had me it started with a bit of a chase and I ended up getting uh basically cornered I took a wrong turn and ended up in the sort of dead end area and the three of them stood there and they started talking to each other about what they were going to do to me uh, and this got more and more graphic and more and more violent and my natural instinct at the time when you've got three people who are threatening you in that way and theoretically it could have been a life and death situation I don't know what their actual true intentions were um your fear kicks in and anybody who says that they you know they don't feel fear that they're basically a psychopath they have no emotions um my freeze response kicked in uh I didn't want to do anything because I knew that as soon as I started something that was the sort of reason to have a, a lot of pain. And this is one of the human conditions where we don't want to move out of one state to another if it's going to cause us pain, even if we know it might be more productive. And what kicked in for me was like, it's almost like the old samurai thing where the samurai would meditate before they went into battle that they were going to die. So what have you got to lose? And that kind of like thought came to my head. You know what? I've got nothing to lose here. Um, so what I did was there was one guy who's a little bit bigger. Uh, he wasn't doing most of the talking, but he looked like he was a guy that was kind of running the show. Uh, so basically, I grabbed the back of his head, latched my teeth onto his nose, and just started ripping and throwing him around. And the other two guys immediately backed off, and that gave me my break to escape. Um, there's a lot of things to that story uh, where if I'd known better at the time, i.e. what I know now, 
I could have probably predicted uh, the fact that these guys had harmful intent towards me. Uh, I'd seen them in a bar. They were paying undue attention to me. Uh, uh, predatory individuals have a kind of process that they, they go through, which is choosing a location, selecting a victim, carrying out surveillance, and synchronizing movement to you, which is tying their movement to yours. This is stuff I understand now, but I didn't understand at the time. So when I look back, I could probably have avoided that situation. But I think when you find yourself actually having to confront violence, one part of it is you're just frozen in time. Everybody experiences that free sensation. What I think differs is with trained people is how quickly you move out of it. So how quickly can you get a grip on your fear? So things from my martial arts background, which had really helped, was uh, one, I was taught like when I competed in judo, how to breathe to actually lower the heart rate, relax me down. So even something as simple as breathing was something that the martial arts gave me, which helped me deal with that situation. Uh, the next thing was that kind of decisiveness that you need to act that you need to do something. Um, and that something doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be sophisticated, but it has to be something fairly extreme in that situation. Uh, the other thing I would say that the martial arts training gave me was knowing when to stop. So I could have held on to this guy for a long, long time. I could have tried to cause a lot of pain. I could have tried to uh, dispense righteous justice on them. But again, I'm in that situation where it's survival, a disengagement opportunity came, go. Um, so I would turn around and say that was from a sort of physical confrontation, um, one time where things didn't really go my way that could have gone very badly. Uh, and I'll put down to the fact that there's always an element of luck in these situations. And in that time, there was an element of luck that was going with me. Sure. And I think that's a great story. And it's it's one that, you know, certainly doesn't follow any traditional TV outcome or, or progression or, no. or movie. You know, we, we, we're conditioned that, you know, fights with martial artists tend to be either, you know, what we were talking about before, avoided entirely yeah. or, you know, these big dramatic scenes. And, you know, in, unless I missed something or, or you left some things out, there wasn't any quote unquote martial arts no. in that story. I mean, there was, the, there was the spirit, there was the mindset, but no technique. And, and I think that's one of the things which uh, Karmagar tries to stress. I, I always say to my students, I really don't believe in techniques. Um, techniques make up part of a solution in certain situations, but we're much more about teaching a solution. Um, one of the things I think a lot of people still have out there who are untrained have this idea that what they need to deal with a situation is a technique. Um, I remember uh, a, a time in my life when I was doing a lot more kind of like social events in terms of promoting what I do. And I remember one guy coming up to me and saying, could you show me how to get out of a full Nelson? And my whole kind of sort of attitude to that is, well, how, are you, how did you get into a full Nelson? And what are you going to do after you get out of the full Nelson? You know, that sort of technique or solution to that particular problem is only a very small slither and small part of the overall situation. Because how did you let somebody get up behind you, raise your arms above your head, that you actually need that technique in the first place? And if you do escape, what are you going to do now? Because... The guy is still an attacker. There may be other people in the vicinity that can assist him. And I think one of the problems that the public has is that they're like, just teach me a technique. Just show me how to get out of this wrist grab. Just show me how to get out of this side headlock. And I think, unfortunately, uh, in many ways, a lot of self-defense kind of panders to that and says, yeah, look, I'll, I'll show you how to deal with a hair grab. Um, but violence happens in real life situations. Uh, and we talk about there being five situational components. The location, everybody tends to think it's going to be like some deserted dark alley. It could be your home. We talk about relationship. Everybody thinks they're going to be attacked by a stranger. Uh, 
if you're female, you're more likely to be sexually assaulted by somebody you know in your home or somebody else's. Uh, we talk about motive. We talk about your state of mind. Are you completely surprised? Are you prepared? Are you accepting that in your life you might have to deal with a violent situation? And we talk about third parties who are with you, i.e. if you're a um, mother with two young children, guess what? That's your lifestyle. You're spending a lot of time with them. It means that they might be with you when you're assaulted. So when we start looking at all these components and factors and put them together, sometimes techniques just don't have a place. And what you have to roll back on are kind of like ideas and concepts. Um, when we teach, for instance, uh, dealing with knife, I will demonstrate a technique. But the technique to me really just talks about the concepts behind how to uh, control or disarm somebody with a knife, i.e. take the movement of the weapon away, because if a knife can't move, it can't cut. So that could mean like simply just pressing it against a person's body. Get two arms against one arm uh, and use your body weight. And when you start looking at that and say, right, okay, forget the technique, think of the concept. Somebody who's never uh, had to deal with a certain or particular knife threat or attack can actually formulate a solution. And that's really what we're trying to train in Krav Maga is how people can be creative and how they can come up with a solution in a situation. They might never have actually practiced dealing with that particular threat or attack before, but because they have this sort of toolbox of concepts and principles, they can create that solution on the fly. I don't teach, uh, for example, you know, okay, what you're gonna do in this situation is bite somebody's nose. But I know in group violence, that there are primary attackers, secondary attackers, and tertiary attackers. So the primary attacker is the guy who's going to get involved, whatever. The secondary attackers are kind of there supporting. If they're called on to get involved, they'll get involved. But if they have an excuse not to get involved, they won't. So when I understand that group dynamic, what I understand I have to do in a situation is basically enact um, a form of extreme violence against that primary assailant kind of in the hope that the secondary assailants will be put off from getting involved. And as they back away, that creates disengagement. So it's not really a technique like you were saying. It's more the working of some fundamental concepts and principles that allows me to create a solution in that moment. And that's one of the things that we try and teach in Krav Maga. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So... Who would you say, because we haven't talked a lot about the, the influences that, that got you into judo. I mean, you mentioned there was some bullying, but clearly there was some influence. In, and I'd say any child that sticks with martial arts for any period of time, there are some people supporting them, usually their parents. And anybody that continues to train as an adult, there are people supporting them. And, and there are reasons why they stick with it. If we pinned you down and said, who has been the most influential person? in your martial arts career? Who would you say that is? Um, so within the martial arts kind of world, I would say there were two individuals. Um, one is a instructor named Dennis Hanover in Israel who really started to show me how uh, training had to be dynamic, that you couldn't train statically that everything, an attack was dynamic, so a defense had to be dynamic, and you had to train that way. Uh, he was also uh, a guy with just immense uh, wisdom. Anybody who's met him, anybody who's trained with him will tell you that he's one of those people that just changes your life. Um, although I don't train with him now, he's one of those individuals I probably think about every day, that somewhere in my uh, thoughts for the day, Dennis Hanover comes up. And again, there's, I would say that's the same of just about everybody who's trained with him. Uh, just mm -hmm. phenomenal from a technical point of view, phenomenal from just that sort of like, um, you know, almost like that guru, the person who's sort of telling you this is a way that you want to lead your life. He's also a very interesting character from the develop development of the martial arts in Israel. Um, what he was doing sort of back in the 60s and 70s was what was really mixed martial arts. He was combining judo, uh, kokushin, karate, and traditional jiu-jitsu. 
uh, to basically create his own fighting style. So the guy is a kind of pioneer in the martial arts is sort of like 20, 30 years ahead of everybody who's doing MMA now. And the focus for what he was doing was not for sport or competition, but for survival. Uh, his system is known as uh, Dennis Hissardut, uh, Hissardut meaning survival, so Dennis survival. Um, another guy who's very influential was uh, somebody I met a few years back, uh, a man called Mickey Agilin, who was one of Emmy Lichtenfeld's uh, first 10 black belts. And just from a training perspective, uh, somebody who's really influenced uh, the way that I train myself and the way that I train others. Uh, so from in the martial arts kind of community, which is where most of my influences, I have to say, come from, those would be two individuals that I would probably select as the most influential. Um, from a competitive background, my old sen judo sensei, Jimmy Oliver, uh, who I trained with, who actually got me to the point where I was competing at the national level. Uh, I really can't sort of say enough about him in terms of just his understanding and uh, the way he developed me as a judoka was, was kind of phenomenal. Um, a guy who really put the emphasis on the individual rather than the system. Uh, but he was more from that sports competitive background. Mickey and Dennis more from that sort of holistic martial arts instructor perspective. Sure. So this is the first time competitions come up in our conversation. Right. Tell us tell us about your, your time with competing. Um, so one of the things, uh, I'm a fairly intense person when I get into something. So <laughs> once I started doing the judo, that was kind of my life. Um, I didn't really play other sports. Um, that was what I did. And... I kind of did it to the exclusion of a lot of other things, which might have made me a much more well-rounded individual as an adult. But I was very kind of focused in that channel. Um, and the judo club that I belonged to was a competitive club. They were all about competing. Um, so it was very natural as a child and as a youth that I competed. And... To cut a very long story short, by the time I went to university, um, I'd won several regional titles. And the way that uh, judo in the UK worked was you accrued points on the number of regional titles that you won. Uh, and that basically gave you access to being training with the national team as a prospective member of an Olympic team. Um, so I had the good fortune of training with the national team. And that allowed me in 1992 to win the UK national title uh, under 65 uh, kilograms. Uh, and at that time, that was where I thought that my kind of career would go, that I would end up being a competitive judoka. Um, the problem was when I look back, and I think this is the naivety of youth and the arrogance of youth, that there was about two other individuals who were better than me. And in a sport like judo, if there's two in, uh, individuals in your weight category who are better than you, you're not really going to get a look in. Because if you're going to be putting an Olympic team forward, and that was really my dream at the time, it's going to be the top guy. At the time, I felt, again, slightly due to arrogance and the winning of a national title, that I could be that top guy. Uh, what cut me short and actually probably saved me from making the mistake of going down that kind of professional competitor, and there's also not a lot of money in judo, was uh, I had a back injury soon after uh, winning the national title, which really put me out for about two to three years of uh, competing and actually practicing judo at all. Um, and that kind of saved me in one sense because I had to find an alternative path an alternative route. At the time, it was extremely depressing, and uh, you know, it, it almost felt like my life had ended. This has been the route that I thought my life would take. Looking back, um, it kind of set me on another path, which uh, I feel has been a much more profitable and productive one as far as my life is uh, concerned. Mm. Okay. If you had the chance to train with. Anybody, anybody that's ever lived, 
in any style of martial art, you know, alive now, or, or maybe they've passed on, who would you want to train with? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, there were several people that I'd like to train with. Uh, and uh, again, one of them, uh, several of them are still alive. So that's a distinct possibility. Uh, one of the most influential uh, individuals to me in terms of the personal safety, uh, training in scenarios, so sort of actually putting a context around a training experience, uh, is a guy called Richard Dimitri. Um, he uh, lives, works up in Canada, which actually isn't too far from uh, where both of us are based. And he was one of the first guys I saw actually sort of turning around and saying, look, the most important part of your self-defense training is not the physical techniques. It really is that understanding of what violence looks like. So I remember watching his DVDs like oh, 20 years ago and kind of being a little bit blown away that here was a guy who was saying, like, forget all this emphasis on techniques. What you want to look on is understanding how a scenario unfolds, how you can prepare yourself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and one of the things which kind of like sort of uh, reinforced my Krav Maga training was I was getting that kind of replicate, uh, replicated message. Um, but he's somebody I would love not really just even to, to train with, but to sit down and talk to uh, because I think his understanding of uh, violence is quite unique uh, and he has a lot of uh, kind of information and wisdom to share on that. So, so that would be one person. I, I wouldn't even have to train with a phone call would be one of those great conversations uh, mm. just to kind of like uh, talk to him uh, about these things. Um, I guess if I was looking back, it's going to be everybody's classic, but I would like to go back and talk to Bruce Lee. You know, uh, there's an extremely influential martial artist who I think saw the way that training uh, was going and was a little bit ahead of his time in that. Um, so that's another person, not even to physically train, but more kind of like to pick brains with and get his perspective on what the martial arts are, how they should be developing uh, to deal with real life uh, situations. So I would say those are sort of one living, one dead, who uh, would be great to have a sit down and a chat with. Um, and if training came up, that would be fantastic as well. Sure. Yeah, of course, a lot of people have referenced Bruce Lee for having that that similar kind of adaptive yeah. Um, selective component that you brought up as being a, a foundational piece of Krav Maga yeah. earlier as we were talking. And, and I actually thought of Bruce Lee and, you know, I didn't want to interject that because I didn't want to steal your thunder if you brought him up <laughs> later. But here, here we have that. And of course, yeah, I think there's a lot of synergy between the concepts of you as yeah. you've laid them out with Krav Maga and the fundamentals of Jeet Kune Do. Are you at all a movie guy? Do you like martial arts um, movies? I watched a lot of martial arts movies as a teenager. Um, not so much now. I'm partial to um, the odd samurai movie now. Um, anything with a huge battle scene is always good for me. But I uh, I do enjoy watching like the traditional uh, samurai movies. Um, as a as a teenager, I devoured like Jackie Chan stuff, uh, Snake and Eagle's Shadow, Drunken Master. All of that kind of stuff was um, was was just fantastic, and I, I think it's again it shows um, where I was as a youth, sort of looking at like the martial arts. What are the most fantastic moves? You know, in judo, I was just interested in one of the most fantastic throws. Um, and as you grow older and you start actually dealing with real life violence, you come kind of complete circle and just go, you know, the simpler the better. Keep it simple. But uh, I used to love the Jackie Chan movies uh, from that era uh, as a teenager. And those were stuff that I just absolutely devoured. Um, just amazing athleticism, uh, fight scenes that were incredibly well choreographed. So as a teenager, that was really the sort of stuff that I consumed. Uh, nowadays, I'll watch... Uh, Japanese samurai movies normally when I'm on a treadmill or something like that where I can follow the uh, subtitles. So that tends to be sort of kind of like default now. And 
I'm not particularly selective in what I watch. If it's a online movie with subtitles, okay, that'll be on when I'm on the treadmill. For for people that are listening, if there was one that they wanted to check out that you like particularly, I, I heard you say that you're not selective, but um, w- without saying it has to be a favorite, but is is there one that you might offer as an example? Um, it is, it's not the most original, but I would turn around and say, what's the Seven Samurai, um, from which the Magnificent Seven, the Western, was taken. Um, and it would almost be good to watch the Seven Samurai and then the Magnificent Seven, because... What you see in the Seven Samurai is uh, a lot more of that kind of, I would say, that subtle martial arts skill uh, where there's kind of an understanding before violence happens that violence is going to happen. That kind of almost sixth sense, um, which kind of got lost a bit in The Magnificent Seven. Um, I think because it was a more, again, commercial Hollywood style movie. But I think if people watch those back to back, uh, they might get an appreciation for uh, some of the subtleties of Japanese cinema. Um, again, not to be too artsy about it, there's kind of uh, two schools of acting in uh, Japanese kabuki theatre, which is kind of one which is very minimalist uh, and subtle, and one which is very kind of like large movements, exaggerated and big. And it's interesting to see in a movie like The Seven Samurai how those kind of two schools of acting intertwine. Uh, And it just makes it a very, very rich movie. Mm. Yeah, classic, classic movies. Absolutely. And everyone should check them out, of course. We'll link those and some of the other things that we've talked about and continue to talk about over on the website for anyone that might be new. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And I'll remind you of that later on as well. Now, you mentioned earlier that you're a reader. Yeah. So I'm guessing at some point martial arts books have come across your desk yes are there any in particular that you like um there's a really good uh Kramaga book by uh al yanilov and Emil lichtenfeld the founder on armed assaults um if i was advocating somebody to buy a Kramaga book other than my own that would be where i'd point them um it's probably one of the most well laid out and presented books on martial arts that there's ever been uh i mean it's probably about 20 years old now um but just very very clear cut and precise um one of those books where it was obviously very very clear that the author knew what they wanted to do and deliver and actually accomplished it and and that's quite hard as an author myself you have a kind of vision for a book um and as you write it and things come up, sometimes that vision gets distorted or slips away a little bit and you need to rein it in. And um, it's a hard job when you start writing to actually sort of go, right, this is the purpose of the book and this is what it's going to meet and this is how it's going to meet it. That book is absolutely uh, excellent for kind of the authors obviously had a goal and achieved it really, really well. Um, other stuff that I read from um, martial arts, martial artists, uh, the writings of Jigoro Kano, the founder of judo. Um, I would turn around and say any martial artist, that should be a must read. Uh, Jigoro Kano, for those who don't know, was a professor of education. So what he was all about was how to educate people, how to teach people. And in his writings, you see a guy who was like, I mean, this was a guy who came up with the belt system that we all use. Probably one of the most influential martial artists, per se. But he talks about like how people learn um, and how to basically enhance their learning. And I would say if you're a martial arts instructor, regardless of the style, the discipline that you teach, it really is worth reading them because you'll come away with uh, a better understanding of how your students learn. You know, whether it's judo, karate, whether it's Krav Maga. Um, And his writings have been really influential in the way that I teach and very much teach to the individual rather than teach to the class. Uh, He's a big kind of stressor on that. Yeah, absolutely. And and we've talked a bit about him through various episodes. We we did an episode on, on rank and, of course, gave him all the credit 
for coming up with the belt <laughs> system. I mean, it's it's pretty well documented. Yeah. So th- th- those are those are great. Now you mentioned that you are an author, so yes. tell us about some of the things you've written. Um. So I have a book out which is Kramagar, uh Real World Solutions to Real World Violence, and my goal in it was to actually try and teach people how to use Kramagar. So, and I'm not again paying a disservice to any other Kramagar authors out there. But a lot of Kramagar books and a lot of martial arts books tend to end up as a kind of encyclopedia of techniques rather than mm. telling people this is how you apply the technique in a particular situation. One of the things we always talk about is like the when. So if somebody is holding a gun to your head, when do you make the disarm? Not just how do you do it, but when do you do it? What's the moment that you pick? What's your decision-making process that leads you to decide that that's a solution, that that's the way that you should go? So, um, for example, in a mugging scenario, we'll talk about scripts. That A mugger's script is to go up to somebody, again, after selecting a location, selecting a victim, carrying out surveillance on them, synchronizing their movement, which means just basically tying their movement to theirs in some way. It could be approaching them. It could be following them. Uh, Sticking a weapon to them, let's say it's a gun in this case, and demanding a wallet. So we'll talk about that if it's resources that you have, such as a wallet, a laptop, a phone, hand it over to the person. If then they stay, they've gone off script from being a mugger because the mugger script says they should take the item and go. So now we're starting to talk about, okay, this is when you should think about performing a disarm. Then we'll look at, well, what are all the things mentally, the peripheral doubts that you have that are going to prevent you from making that disarm? So all the things that turn around and go, what if he pulls a gun away? What if I'm not quick enough? What if I lose grip? So they're all things which basically stop us from being decisive and basically sort of freeze us into inaction. So we'll talk about having a, a tagline that you say such as, is there anything else you want? And what we'll do is tell you to go and make the disarm on the third syllable. Is there any? So that's when you're going to make the movement. So it's akin to if you're going to do something like a bungee jump, where you go one, two, three, go. So we'll talk in the book about not just this is how you make a gun disarm, but this is when you do it. And this is how you kind of force yourself to do it. So very much in the writing that I wanted to do was not just say, look, this is how you disarm, but this is when. These are the type of situations uh, that these type of violence occurs in. Um, This is how you can predict it. This is how you can form uh, a system of decision making. Um, And that's what makes Krav Maga work. A lot of people get caught up on, oh, it's simple techniques. It's not really it's simple techniques. Um, One of the examples I always give of this is uh, blocking. So I've been training martial arts since I was eight, so over 35 years. And my reaction time, when we consider degradation with age, is probably not much faster than anybody else's. So I don't have any physical skills or attributes which really elevate me beyond the average person. But I can predict much earlier when somebody is going to make a punch or a strike because I've 20 plus years working in the security industry. I've had people throw punches at me and I know what those precursors are and those pre-violent indicating movements are. So Mm. what I've tried to do in the book is share those with people. So people have kind of that knowledge of like, this is what a person who's about to throw a strike is, is the way that they're going to act and behave so that they have that little bit of predictive element which gives them the time to prepare. That's what makes Kramagar work. Not so much the physical block, but the ability to predict when somebody is going to throw that strike before they throw it. Um, so that's a lot of what I've tried to communicate in the book. This is how you get your Krav Maga to work. Yes, there are techniques listed, but really it's about how you get those techniques to work as part of a solution. And it sounds like from your description that even though the book is targeted at Krav Maga, I, as someone who is not a Krav Maga instructor or practitioner, might still benefit from reading it. Um, and, and that was uh, 
that was also one of the goals that um, we didn't want. And I would say we, because uh, I have a team of instructors, uh, I have people who edit the book, you know, so I always look on it as a team effort. Um, yeah, we wanted to make it to be appealing to people from other disciplines, that they could take something out of it, that maybe they have a technique that they're conversant with, that they're happy, you know, which kind of could be substituted for one of our techniques. Um and I know that's kind of weird when you're trying to promote Krav Maga, but really it's sort of saying like, okay, if you've got 20 plus years of doing a disarm or a knife control in a particular way, I'm probably not going to teach you uh, a way which you prefer, but I can teach you all the components around that technique so that you can get it to work for you or you can get it to work better for you. Um, so when we wrote it, we really did want to appeal to a much broader audience than just those who practice Krav Maga. Uh, and a lot of the feedback that we've got from the book has been from people from other martial arts, uh, which is extremely rewarding because we now know that that goal is kind of like being achieved. Uh, mm. We didn't want to just stay in that sort of narrow Krav Maga um, world where there's kind of, I don't know, People say, oh, well, I wouldn't use that technique. I would use that technique. This technique's better than that technique. That technique wouldn't. I wanted to stay away from that. Uh, I don't, really don't have a time for that kind of partisan uh, support for a particular system. If you want to discuss and debate and compare so that we can all learn out of it, I'm all for that. But if you just wanted to tell me, well, my Krav is better than your Krav I really don't want to write a book that kind of promotes that idea. Uh, so one of the ways to try and get away from that is to try and have it that much larger appeal where people from other disciplines, other styles can look in and go, yeah, I can take that. I can use that. That's similar to what we do. Yeah. I understand those concepts and principles and I can apply them to my own training. That makes sense. And I think that's great. And of course, we'll link to the book at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com again. And so since we're kind of on this this vein, I mean, we got we'll, we'll swap one of the questions around. Okay. We're, we're going to wind down shortly. But if someone wants to get a hold of you, if they want to talk about the book, if they're in the greater Boston area and they want to come train, or I don't know if you offer seminars, to, this, this is your commercial. Okay, you know, tell tell us what you've got going on other than the book, and and okay. sell us. On it. <laughs> okay, so um, at my school, uh, one of the things we do every six weeks is we do a specialist seminar. We've got one coming up tomorrow. Uh, I know that'll be too short notice for most people, which is looking at uh, home invasions. So we'll talk about the dynamics of a home invasion, uh, preventative measures, who gets targeted, why they get targeted, the motivations uh, of those who commit these type of crimes, and the types of situation that you might end up in from a physical perspective. So every six weeks we're having those. Um, they're free to members of the school because uh, we see that as part of their ongoing training. But we also open them up uh, to the public. Um, if anybody in the Boston area wants to have a look, if you go to the website, which is www.bostoncraftmagar.com, uh, there's a link on the front page uh, to that seminar. So that's something we do for the public. Um, we also, uh, for those in the Boston area who want to train, uh, we, we do like a week to 10 day free trial. So a lot of our big thing is not to uh, try and verbally sell people on Krav Maga and the Krav Maga that we teach, but get them to come down and train and just see if they like it. Is this what you want to do? Um, and we've always taken a very sort of like easy, non-hard sell approach. Um, so we don't do contracts or anything like that. We very much come down and train, see if this is what you want to do. Um, so we're very open um, about that. Uh, if people want kind of to get a better idea of what I do or my perspective on things, uh, I have a weekly blog that I write, uh, sometimes more frequently depending on events, which is www.kravmagarblog.com. And that also has a contact form. So if people have questions, ideas for a blog article, uh, I'm always happy to write. If people want to comment, uh, offer criticism, um, I always say as long as it's kind of educated, you know, you know, it, it's very difficult to respond 
to somebody who just goes, I don't agree with you. You know, it's like, okay, let, let's move this on. What parts don't you agree with? Um, but we'll always engage in that type of discussion uh, and debate because I look on it as I'm not the finished article. I've got stuff that, you know, I'm learning all the time. I'm learning on the mats when I teach. Um, I'm learning from discussions uh, that I have with people, uh, other Karmagar instructors. Um, I kind of see everything in martial arts as it should be collaborative, that rather than sort of hiding behind a system, you know, and creating division, we should all be talking and discussing, you know, wh why do you do something the way that you do it? Um, is it something because you've never thought about it? Um, or, and now you are thinking about it? Um, have you got a better perspective on it than me? Because I don't want to think that this is the end of my journey. I want to keep developing. I want to be growing as a martial artist. And the only way I can do that is if people debate and discuss with me. Um, so through that Kramagar blog, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I can't remember how many articles I've been writing it about five years. So there's, there's a lot and they're not long articles. It may be a thousand words, which is kind of like stressing an idea. Um, you know, I'm more than happy if somebody wants to go like, I think you've got this wrong, or I think a better perspective or another perspective would be this. There's a contact form on the site. Contact me, tell me. Sure. And I'm more than happy to discuss and get back to you. Um, our school is very, very open on that. Um, we never turn around and say, we've got the best Kramagar, we're the only Kramagar. We're like, this is what we do, and this is the reason that we do it. Um, and you know what? I'm happy to discuss those reasons with uh, anybody. And I kind of welcome that debate, not from an argumentative point of view, but if you've got something, an idea, an experience that I can learn from, you know, I, I want to hear that. I want to be exposed to it. I completely agree. And I like the words that you're using, argument versus debate. You know, as martial artists, we challenge each other and we can do so in a healthy way. Yes as you're talking about, because that makes everyone better. Absolutely. If you and I disagree, if we have a conversation and we both learn something out of that exchange, even if no, nobody's mind has been changed, right. you are still a better martial artist. I am still a better martial artist. It, and I think that that's absolutely, it, the goal. Sorry, because it might reinforce an idea that you have and it might reinforce an idea that I have. And I go, okay, you know, I'm more convinced now that I'm right in that idea. And there's nothing wrong. With them. You're absolutely right. Neither one of us has changed our minds, but we both have a better understanding. And I, I think that is the goal of debate. Right. I agree. So those are all great things. Everything we've talked about today has been great. And I really, really appreciate your time. But we've got one more question. We always okay. go out this way. What advice would you offer to the folks that are listening? Uh, it's probably the same advice that every instructor who's been on your podcast gives, which is keep training. Um, you know, I've had times in my martial arts kind of journey where I felt it's not worth it. And this is somebody who I consider myself extremely passionate about the martial arts. Um, I've had times where the training and instruction that I've been given hasn't made sense to me in the short term. And when I go a little bit further along the path, it starts to make sense with me. So if you're training under an instructor, there might be something that you don't get, that you don't understand. Um, and it's very easy to be extremely dismissive and turn around and go like, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's pure rubbish. Or that technique would never work. Um, and as you go a little bit further on, you realize, ah, that technique will work in this situation. The situation that I was thinking about, no, it wouldn't work. So it's kind of having that little bit open-mindedness, uh, trusting the instructor and basically keeping with the training. Um, I always say to people, look, Kramaga, uh, the Israeli military have been using it in one form or another for so many years. And guess what? every new recruit into the IDF is trained in Krav Maga, that probably makes it, as a system, the most tested system on the planet, certainly in modern times. 
when we look at the length of time that people have been taught and exposed to Krav Maga and the vast number who have been taught uh, and trained in Krav Maga. And if that's the case, and this is a self-defense system, a martial art that's being employed in one of the toughest, most demanding environments on the planet, it's a good chance that what these guys are telling you works, works. Even if in your particular experience, you might question it. Um, so I would say the same with the traditional martial arts. There's a reason that they've been around for the length of time that they have. So there's a certain amount of faith you can have in that system, just as I can have in Krav Maga. And there will be times when things don't make sense, when something th seems a little bit, um, I wouldn't say stupid, but maybe not particularly effective or not relevant. I'd say just put that doubt aside for a moment, carry on with your training, and see if that question gets answered later on. Um, there's a great quote by one of the, uh, it was in his top student in terms of graded, a guy called Heim Zut, who said, if you only get attacked once in 20 years, you will wish you'd been training for 20 years. And I think that is so true that we can turn around and put ourselves in a state of denial and say, oh, my lifestyle would never uh, get me exposed to violence. I'm too old or whatever. Violence is something, and again, I, I've had a career of it. When it visits you, oh, my God, you wish you'd been training. And I would hate for anybody to give up their training going like, okay, I've got what I need to know, or I don't believe this is going to be applicable to me. And then, I don't know, a week, a year, two years later, finding themselves in a situation where they wish they'd continue to keep up their training. So I would say my advice is, you know, whether the odds are physical, mental, or emotional, keep up your training. Thank you for listening to episode 114 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Ben Karen. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find links to the history of Krav Maga, Mr. Ben Karen's blog, his book, his business website, some social media, and a whole lot more. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is always Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, you can check out our sort of secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, you can do that on there as well. If you like the show, make sure you've got one of our great apps or you're subscribing with your favorite podcast app. You know, we're always asking for reviews because they really help spread the word about the show and push us up in the rankings. If you like what we're doing, this is the best way to help us out. And remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites looking for reviews. If we find your review, we'll mention it on the air, and then you can email us for your free pack of Whistlekick stuff. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our shin guards. School owners and team coaches, hit us up, wholesale.whistlekick.com. We've got our discounted wholesale program over there. You should definitely take advantage of it. We'll be back soon, but until next time, you know how it goes. Train hard. Smile and have a great day.